Welcome back to Half the Battle. I'm your host as always, Daniel Levy, your co-host Shaq. We're going to be recapping UFC 226 and the Tough 27 finale. And Shaq, uh, Daniel DC Cormier is now the champ champ. Yeah, man, that was one of the greatest uh, moments in UFC history for him to take out the best heavyweight of all time in Stipe Miocic. Daniel doesn't get enough cre uh, credit that he deserves a lot of the times, and I feel like uh, he's the champ champ for a reason. The guy's paid uh, paid his dues in the sport, took his losses like a man, and uh, stayed in the game, and now he's the champ champ. Man, it was absolutely unbelievable. You know, I thought it was going to be a first-round knockout, except I thought it was going to be a first-round knockout for Stipe Miocic, and uh, my boy Daniel Cormier, he flipped that script. And on that clinch break, the way he landed that short right hand, man, uh, my dude DC packs a lot of power, doesn't he? Yeah, especially at heavyweight. Like we were saying, um, you know, we did pick Sipe, but, you know, DC uh, hasn't really lost anything at heavyweight. He said he's never lost a wrestling match at heavyweight. So, you know, uh, I guess he keeps that streak uh, going. And, uh, I mean, that was just a crazy moment, man, because DC is such a good guy, and uh, he definitely deserved it. Yeah, you know, I thought it was kind of like a marketing point to say that he's never lost a fight at heavyweight. You know, oh yeah, he beat Bigfoot Silva, Josh Barnett, and Soa Pulele. So I was kind of like, yeah, of course he's undefeated at heavyweight. But now, there's no, uh, it's no marketing point. He really is undefeated at heavyweight. He took out the greatest heavyweight of all time in the first round, Shaq. Yeah, 100%, man. And, you know, that's got to be uh, devastating to Stipe, man. Because, you know, it looked like he was doing good at first, but, like, at some point... uh. Before, right before the knockout, he was making a couple faces, and that was his demise. Indeed it was. Well, you know, on these recap shows, they're always used to us uh, sitting here and bragging about our wins. But uh, as you know, Shaq, uh, we're very honest dudes. And 226, uh, I finally had to take my first uh, losing event since April. Uh, Drakkar Close beat the shit out of Lando Venata. No excuses here. I mean, you know, I can sit here and talk about how I expected Lando to get off that crazy offense like he did in his first four UFC fights. But he didn't. Drakkar was simply the better man. And what we learned from that, in my opinion, is that maybe Lando now falls into, uh, you know, the Jason Knight category where the first couple UFC fights was super exciting, a lot of out, a lot of offense, a lot of output, but he took way too much damage and now he's not the same guy anymore. Yeah, 100 percent. And I feel like, uh, you know, my opinion on Drakkar has changed because I think he just did make better improvements. I feel like he was definitely more comfortable trading punches in the pocket he was a little more firm on his feet he wasn't getting backed up and his clinch work got way better too because you know the casey was reversing him in the clinch and like we said lando you know i guess uh, he just took too much damage in those fights and he's just not operating at the frequency so you know props to jacquard close but you know it doesn't really deter anything we uh, keep moving forward absolutely we do you know friday when according to plan uh luis pena cash that max bet people might be like oh you bet a big favor well hey we hit that at minus 240. It closed at minus uh, 450. So, you know, that's a little sniping going on. But listen, Lando uh, ended my uh, my streak, my first L on events since April. So props to Drakkar. But uh, isn't it nice that we get to bounce back at Boise, the event we've been talking about for a long time? Yeah, 100%. There's a lot of great fights on the uh, night. We're working hard to get the job done, and that's exactly what we're going to do. A hundred percent, and uh, let's uh, let's keep recapping this two twenty six card. I know that I know the fans want to hear about Francis and Ganu versus Derek Lewis, right? I mean, oh my God, what the fuck happened there, man? What did Stepe take my boy Francis Solshack? I mean, you know, I just think it was a case of like I was saying, you know, all along. I feel like Francis. You know, throughout his run, he didn't face any adversity. I know the Blades fight was a little tough, but Blades was a guy with five fights. Now, the Overeem fight was great, you know, but Overeem has been knocked out 11 times. You know, I've, I felt like a guy with those muscles, you know, if he doesn't knock you out early, things aren't going to go his way. I thought it was one of the worst fights ever, but, you know, that's how Black Beast fights. And Francis just didn't pull the trigger, so, you know, I think Stipe you know, did what he did against Francis, you know, but Cormier made a good point. He said that he would have finished Francis in that uh if he would have had that. So, you know, I think Francis, you know, of course, I don't think he's done it. I think he could be like, you know, uh, who's in the heavyweight division? Um, you know, a Struve or a Tybora, <laughs> you know, something like that. But like, you know, I, I didn't think he was going to be UFC champion. Um, you know, that fight was, uh, you know, I guess France happened. I, I don't know. <laughs> Look, man, it's one thing to take, you know, a closely contested loss and, you know, you battled hard. But Shaq, he landed 11 strikes throughout the 15-minute the period, my man. Like, he literally didn't let it go. This wasn't about, you know, he was respecting Black Beast power. It seemed like 
my boy Francis didn't want to be in there at all. And, you know, a lot of people are saying he got rushed. We're talking about a guy that was ranked number one two days ago. We're talking about a guy that beat Curtis Blades and Alistair over him. He gets in there with Derek Lewis and uh, 11 strikes landed throughout the entire 15 minutes, Shaq. Yeah, it was terrible, man. Um, and Dana shit on him pretty hard afterwards, man. You know, he decides to take flights out to France two weeks before his title fight. And, you know, then he, uh, you know, now he's saying the fear from the Stipe fight carried over into this fight. So, you know, uh, I don't know where he goes from here. They better, you know, book him an easy fight. Um you know, I think, Struve. you know, Struve, you know, something like that. But What about you know, Christian Columba? <laughs> <laughs> you know, a, a, a Dan Ho or something like that, you know, just to get his confidence back because, you know, his confidence is pretty much completely sh- uh, shut right now. But, Shaq, the thing I don't get, man, is, you know, when he talks about this fear, it's like, but Black Beast didn't shoot for a single takedown. It's like, isn't what Francis is referring to? He's scared of getting taken down, but Black Beast was standing on the outside, not – trying to take him down at all so what exactly was he scared of um you know just the moment man the moment of losing that big uh he's got a lot of weight on his shoulders bro you know you're coming off that disappointing uh title fight and now you're fighting a guy where you're a, a four to one favorite and you know black beast is a tough guy to fight man like black beast uh presents a lot of ops- you know black beast really doesn't engage that much so you know it's uh but it was all up on francis he had every opportunity to let it go and he uh, chose to have his French moment. <laughs> well, you know, Derek Lewis just beat the uh, number one guy on the planet. So, I mean, you know that means it's a big fight next, right? Yes, sir. And, uh, you know, he's probably either going to fight Volkov or, or Curtis Blade. So, uh, we'll see how that goes for him. Yeah, I'm very intrigued to see uh, what happens next. But let's put a little more emphasis on the champ champ DC because now... He's the heavyweight champ, and look, he weighed in about 246 pounds, so I don't really expect him to go back down to 205 anytime soon, and something we talked about on the preview show with uh, Chas Skelly was that if Daniel Cormier somehow does win this belt, which he did do, Shaq, how, uh, you know, how ironic would it be to see uh, a trilogy between him and John Jones at heavyweight? Yeah, you know, but uh, that would be a, a great thing to see, even though we've seen those... Uh that fight two times and we know that Jones has pretty much uh ruined DC's uh career in the past but you know that guy uh is inactive right now so until he gets act- <clears throat> until he gets active you know uh, I feel like my boy DC should uh, go ahead and defend that belt maybe uh I, should he really even defend the belt I mean honestly like we to make, make that it? uh to to make that weight again I really don't think he uh is going to make that weight again so I think you should just stay at heavyweight, man, and uh, fight all, fight all these uh, heavyweight legends that he couldn't have fought in the meantime. You know what I'm saying? When Kane when Kane was champion and when he was at 205, so I, I think you should uh, build some build some work at heavyweight. So here's the question for you and for the fans listening: Should Daniel DC Cormier just go ahead? Look, the guy's what 39, almost 40 years old. Should he just go ahead and be like, "Hey, man, I had a great career. I'm retiring as the champ. Champ. No one's ever done anything like that." No, or, he's got, he's got what, to have this payday with Brock Lesnar, man. This is a big W. This is their big WWE moment, and they can uh, sell a bunch of pay per views. And then after that, you know, I would honestly, I wouldn't even give John Jones a chance to beat me for a third time. I'll just go ahead and settle off into the sunset and you know, call it a day. You're right. I totally forgot about the Brock Lesnar fight. That's what needs to happen, and he needs to cash in, get that one big that huge paycheck before it's all said and done. But uh, I would assume Daniel Cormier is going to win that fight. So what I'm, you know, I don't want to look past uh, Mr. Lesnar, but we all know this is a cash grab. So what I'm wondering is if he is to defeat Brock Lesnar, should he step away as the champ champ? Or do you think we're talking uh, the Volkovs and the Curtis Blades? Yo, see, that's a big, you know, that's a, that's a big question, man. Cause uh, those guys, uh, those guys are really big. <laughs> And, uh, but DC, man, he's really good, man. When he starts uh, walking forward and, you know, having those volume of punches, you know, switching his stance, he's, uh, and those uppercuts in the clinch, man, they uh, they rung Stipe's bell and then that overhand right definitely rung his bell. So it's going to be interesting to see guys like Blades, you know, who, you know, they're young, guys like Volkov, you know, they're taking care of all these old aging guys like Redoom and Overeem, you know, uh, how they do against my boy DC, the champ champ. Yeah, absolutely. And as far as Stipe is concerned, obviously he needs to take some time off, you know, about six months off. I I think he should let Daniel versus Brock uh, happen. And then after that, I want to see Stipe fight for a title his next fight, no matter what happens with Daniel and Brock. Just because, look, he's the longest reigning champion in UFC heavyweight history. He beat the title defense record. And usually when a long reigning champion loses their belt, they get a title shot their next fight. So I think that should... uh, 
that president should take place here with uh, Stipe as well. I think his next fight should be for a belt. You know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer, you know, if you got knocked out in the first round, you got to win a fight. So I think Stipe needs to win a fight. You know, I feel like him and uh, Kane Velasquez could be a good fight that they could hype up, you know, him being Cormier's teammate. And, I mean, when's the last time you've seen Kane fight? That dude needs to uh, sign a contract, you know what I'm saying? Kane who? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Mike Perry and Paul Felder, they went to war. It was a split decision. I thought it was a pretty clear win for Perry. I thought he was the aggressor the whole time. I thought he busted up Paul Felder. And I thought he showed that, hey, man, I'm a welterweight. You're a lightweight. And, you know, I don't want to sit here and say that someone wanted it more than the other guy. But, I mean, uh, Perry definitely wanted that win badly, Shaq. You know, I thought Perry made improvements at uh, Jackson Winkle Johns with Frank Lester. I think he uh, definitely, I mean, he's always been composed in the line of fire. He's got a very good chin, but uh, I definitely think he, you know, made the right move getting out there, you know, getting away from his old uh, his old training environment. You know, I think it was, you know, I think the size definitely played a factor. I thought it was a close fight, two rounds to one for Perry, and uh, congrats to him. Yeah, absolutely. As far as Felder's concerned, I mean, he would have either lost by decision to Perry or he would have lost by decision to Vic. He probably he took more damage against Perry than he probably would have against Vic. But no matter what, he was going to be taking a, a decision loss this month in July. But props to Felder. You know, he's a true warrior. I'd like to see him back at 155, Shaq. Yeah, 100%. And, uh, you know, uh, I think he's a tough guy, but I definitely think that size played a factor. And he probably made an irrational move. He probably should have just uh, stayed at 55. But, you know, he wanted to get paid, so... Yeah, well, as far as Mike Perry is concerned, I mean, there's a lot of guys on this roster that he can fight. And he's already got some big-name wins. I mean, he already went in there with Danny Hot Chocolate. Even though Paul Felder is a 55er, you know, that is a big name. People know who he is. Also beat the ghost of Jake Ellenberger. So now, you know, I mean, we got to we gotta take on a fringe top 15 guy next. I personally don't want to see him against a guy like Strickland because we kind of – I kind of have a feel for how that would go down. But – uh are you down for uh, the prospects of uh, Zaleski and Perry going to war? Uh, you know, I think Zaleski deserves better than that. You know, Perry uh, lost to Griffin. I think you should fight like uh, Melender, Curtis Melender, or something like that, or you know, uh, maybe a. Uh, you know, I think Curtis Melender and him would uh, be a good fight. Who's a good blood and guts guy at one seventy besides uh, Mike Perry and be- besides Zaleski? Because it sounds like you don't want that fight. I mean, I just feel like, you know, Zaleski's put on a more consistent uh, amount of work. I mean, Zaleski beat Strickland by knockout in the first round. He, you know, uh, he took care of Max Griffin, which Perry didn't. Um, you know, so I think Zaleski deserves like a Magni or a Alex Cowboy Oliveira. But how about Alex Cowboy versus uh, Mike Perry? You know what I'm saying? Okay, okay. Now we're talking. I like that as well. And for Paul Felder, you know, him and I Kinta can finally settle their differences at 55, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, that guy's a real estate agent, though, so I'm not sure. Well, Paul Felder's a commentator, so... uh, That guy doesn't want to fight for the UFC. (laughs) So, Anthony Showtime Pettis, check this out, Shaq. He defeated Michael Chiesa, not by decision, not by split, by second-round submission, 52 seconds into the second round. He taps out Michael Chiesa via triangle armbar, and, you know... I usually only go crazy when I have money on the line, but I didn't have any money on the line, and this was like one of the first times in a while where I got to sit down as a fan and actually like genuinely be happy that a guy won a fight, because you know, normally I'm very emotionally detached, if there's no money on the line, I could give two shits, but you know, when I was, uh, you know, when I was watching the WEC back in the day, and Anthony Showtime jumped off the cage and kicked Benson Henderson's head into the fifth row, you know, these were iconic moments in the sport, man. He's the guy that was on the Wheaties box. He, you know, for a long time, I thought he was going to be the face of the UFC. And obviously he fought some extremely tough competition. You know, you're in there with guys like Dustin, you're in there with guys like Max, you know, you're in there with guys like RDA. You're going to take all those L's, but it was really nice to see him not just beat a guy like Michael Chiesa, but to defeat a a top 10 guy because Chiesa was ranked number nine in the world. And Anthony Showtime went out there and uh, he finished him, Shaq. I mean, uh, you know, I thought it was a good performance, but I definitely think he was a, a, a beneficiary of certain circumstances. I mean, the guy, Kiesa was acting like a joke all week. I mean, he kind of, I mean, I don't want to say he is a joke because he is a top 10 fighter, but, you know, the guy was just acting. I think everyone kind of wanted that to happen. It was good to see happen. You know, he was telling Anthony to go to Bellator, and, you know, he's missing weight, and, you know, he's wearing, 
I don't know what he was wearing. He was wearing like tablecloths in the at the uh, at the little face off. So you know, I think everyone wanted that to happen unless you had to bet on Kiesa. But uh, you know, I think uh, Kiesa needs to definitely get his shit together. I'm, Anthony Pettis ain't back in my opinion. I think it was a good win. I think he was able to uh, you know the whole Dolly incident you know played out into his factor because the second that happened, uh, we kind of had the feeling that Kiesa might be trying to you know bounce out the game and uh, make excuses and you know that's exactly what he did. So props to Pettis. You know I feel like he. Uh, you know, uh, he's uh, back in his top 10. So, you know, there's going to be a big uh, charade of Anthony Pettis' back and all this stuff. But, you know, he's a, he's a good, he's a, he's a great fighter. He's a former champion. I think uh, he should fight the winner of uh, Hernandez and OAM and, uh, you know, have uh, have everything get back to reality. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, look, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not sitting here calling him, uh, you know, a top 10 guy, even though he just beat number nine in the world. But to me, it was kind of like a feel-good moment, kind of like... Yeah. Yeah, you know, it was when, a good uh, moment to see uh, Kiesa get his get his ass beat. You know, kind of like when uh, I know this was a different circumstance in terms of how close the fight was, but it was a feel good moment. Kind of like when Anderson Silva beat Derek Brunson for me, at least because you know he's coming off all those L's and he used to be the man, but then he was taking on the top ten guy and he actually went out there and got the win. You could see how much it meant to him. So you know, I was just so happy to see Anthony Showtime Pettis go out there and do that, man, and. Uh, as far as the actual fight itself, you know, damn, Michael Chiesa is a big guy inside that cage, man. The size difference was huge, but, you know, AP, I'll tell you what, he got back up to his feet from the takedowns. Uh, he stuffed some of them as well, and then when Chiesa threw that body kick, uh, Anthony Pettis countered with a beautiful straight right. He heard him. He went for the flying knee, and then on the mat, uh, we already knew that Am Anthony Pettis has a very dangerous guard, and uh, he utilized that and got a performance of the night. Yeah, it was a great. Uh, it was a great thing to see. I definitely uh, think his fight with uh, Dustin still showed that he had uh, good attacks off his back, and uh, he still uh, can pull off a couple fluke armbars. Yeah, man. yeah. Well, like you said, you called a fluke armbar on the shot. I wouldn't necessarily call the actual finish a fluke because you were setting him up for it the entire time. But it was just awesome to see. As far as what's next for him is concerned, look, he just beat the number nine guy in the world. I don't care if he's back or if he's not back. That means you, you're getting a big fight next. I know there's an event coming to Milwaukee soon. I think Anthony should headline that. And I'd like to see him, uh, you know, after uh, James Vick gets this big win over Justin Gaethje, I'd love to see James Vick versus Anthony Pettis in the main event in Milwaukee. Yeah, that would be a, a, a good uh a good fight. <laughs> Indeed. And as far as Kiesa, uh, he's got a lot of things to figure out, man. You know, go return those fucking pineapple pajamas that you got. You know, go... Uh... Hey, thank God he didn't blame uh, the loss on a staph infection, uh, you know, on Ariel's show today. At least he took his L like a man. But uh, it's, time, it's time to get a little humble. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the one suddenly thing... Uh, I think he just needs to uh, get his head right. You know, I think the whole Connor thing... Uh, you know, really affected him. Yeah, I mean, if he goes up to 170, how hilarious would him versus Tractor Prezerish be? <laughs> it wouldn't be good for his body. <laughs> I think he needs to stay at 55. He just needs to figure a couple things out. And if he does stay at 55, look, they haven't updated the rankings, so they currently got him number nine. Uh, you know, I was suggesting Felder versus Ayakinta, but if Ayakinta wants to sell houses, you could always do Felder versus Kiesa. Yeah, that works too, you know. Or um, how about... Uh... How about Kiesa get fed to, you know, something like Dan Hooker or Gregor, you know? Oh, yeah, my boy Dan Hooker has been putting in work, that's for sure. So the opening fight of the main card, Khalil Roundtree went out there and knocked out Gokan Saki in under two minutes. And, you know, I famously said on the show that if you bet on a Khalil Roundtree, you should retire from betting. And uh, apparently I was wrong about that, Shaq. And, uh, man, uh, Khalil, it's funny because... As soon as the fight started, I looked at you and I was like, oh, so Khalil's going to win, right? It's because the MMA movement really frustrated the kickboxer. It's a different style. You could see that MMA footwork uh, taking place in there. It's kind of like a local fight that you and I saw recently a couple months back. Uh, you know, the, the, the fans listening don't know about it. But when I give you this example, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. You remember when uh, Rusty Crowder fought Gerald Bowman? And Gerald Bowman's this Muay Thai guy. Rusty Crowder's this MMA guy. And Rusty Crowder was using that MMA footwork and completely confused him and went out there and got the win. That's kind of what this reminded me of, man. Khalil Rauchy was moving around like an MMA guy. Gokan uh, had no answer for the movement, and then uh, it was a straight punch that put him down. Yeah, you know, Khalil definitely, you know, had a bad reputation going into that fight. You know, in certain circumstances, you know, he 
my opinion of him really doesn't change, but I think it was, you know, I thought Gokhan Saki was a fraud. You know, I thought Khalil would give him every chance to win because that's what Khalil generally does. But, you know, it's a, it's a, I guess that finally confirmed that, you know, kickboxing is a different sport. Like we saw with Chikadze and, you know, Gokhan kickboxing is a completely different sport. It's completely different gloves. Unless you're uh, in Israel. Oh yeah, well yeah, Israel's just a, a different uh, a different <laughs> a different case. But uh, you know, um, these other guys though, like well, Israel's been training for a longer time than these guys too, man. Like and Israel's Saki's, a twenty eight year old specimen, so you know, exactly. it's, a, it's a different yeah. story. And like Gokhan Saki's got two fights, and you know, Giga chikadze has got like four fights against all bums. So you know, it's a it's a you know, a lot of people. I definitely understand that these kickboxers, you know, they've putting down several guys, so you're expecting them to just come down here and uh, touch a chin, and you know, this thing is going to be over. But that finally confirmed it's a different sport. Uh, props to Roundtree. I think Saki, you know, I thought he was a fraud after his debut. I thought it was real ugly, and uh, you know. I guess I should have stuck to that initial opinion, but you know, props around you. My opinion doesn't change. I think you know when he goes back to fighting wrestlers, you know, you're probably gonna most likely, you know, he might get a little better, but most likely you're gonna see the same thing. But uh, props around you. He he shit on a lot of people. A lot of people, uh, you know, had uh, had some things to say, including myself. So you know, props to Roundtree. Uh, he uh, did his job that night. So uh, you want to see Roundtree versus Dominic Reyes next, or what? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know. Um, Man, what was it two oh five? Um Sam Alvey. Um No, nah, he doesn't deserve that. Alvey's like ten and four. Um give him um damn you already beat Paul Craig. Um What about oh I know I know who. The guy whose name shall never be named. What about uh the guy that was about to thirty twenty six? Paul Craig, Mike, and then Mike. tapped out with one second left. How about him versus Khalil? <laughs> yeah, that would, uh, my boy Magomed ain't alive. That would be a, a great fight. Is my boy Magomed still alive? You know, we haven't heard a, a word from him since that fight happened, man. Yeah, I don't think he is alive. I think uh, they took away his AMG Mercedes and they, you know, buried him in the desert somewhere. But, you know, uh, how about uh, Khalil Rauchy versus somebody like John Volante or something? Okay, John Volante versus Khalil. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, you think my boy uh, Jean Volant should find a way to lose a split there? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> and as far as Gokhan, I mean, uh, how many more softballs can we give the guy? Are we thinking, uh, you know, should he do a catchweight with Christian Colombo? Like, are we thinking uh, George Piano? To, to, to be honest, I wouldn't be shocked if that's the last time we see him because, like, you know, it's a different sport, man. It's like he bet. To be honest, his debut against uh, Enrique De Silva, I thought was atrocious. But you know, the knockout was so glorious that uh, it kind of erased everyone's memory. But uh, you know, I think to be honest, I wouldn't be shocked if that's the last time we see him. If he came back, I mean, you gotta find you gotta find bottom of the barrel. I mean, I think to to get this guy to you know really win a fight, I think you're gonna have to like bring someone in like a can from the local scene. So I wouldn't be shocked if that's the last time we have seen him. Who you got between Gokhan Saki and Paul Craig? Um, Paul Craig probably, man, because like the second <laughs> the fight, the second the fight hits the mat, it's probably over. The thing is, does Paul Craig really go for takedowns? He's more, you know, attacking uh, people off his back. He'll, he'll just pull guard. True, he'll probably submit him there too. All right, makes sense. So Paulo Costa, it's funny they call him Paulo Costa now because you know trying to make him a little bit more marketable. You remember when they were calling my boy Christoph Jocko Chris Jocko? So now it's not Paulo Boracina anymore. It's Paulo Costa. They want to build their new star, and uh, you know what? He beat the shit out of Uriah Hall. It's interesting, dude. The force of those body punches, even like mid into the second round. Uh, my boy Boracina hits hard as fuck, Shaq. Yeah, you know, uh, we predicted that, you know, the second he uh, got going. You know, of course, we said Hall had the ability to put anyone's lights on, and he, you know, hit him with that shot beyond the ear, and his uh, equilibrium got wobbled a little bit, but he was fine. Paolo's just a, like Paolo said in the pre-fight, he's a fucking animal, you know? He's just, he's a fucking animal. He's going to move forward and butcher your body in with body kicks and body punches. He was looking like middleweight uh, John Lineker out there, you know what I'm saying? He, he butchered Hall's body in to the point where Hall had to just take a, take that you know face down face down map into the uh into the map but i thought hall actually fought tough because i thought he could have i thought he wanted to go down very uh way before that and i thought he uh, actually hung in there a little bit but paolo's just too much of a fucking animal as far as uh i know people are talking about paolo and israel next 
I don't think Paolo wants that smoke, to be nah. honest. <laughs> I think Paolo uh, should, you know, fight. I think the Weidman fight was a good call out. Um, or, you know, he should fight somebody like, you know, a Bronson or, you know, um, I think Elias. they got time to, you know, on the last. I feel like they got time to, to build Paolo up. I don't think they need to rush anything. Yeah, look, I was thinking Elias could either take on Paulo Costa or Israel, you know, because, I mean, Elias got that name. But, but, but we, have a, we have another opponent for Elias, bro. Yeah, that's true, but my, my boy uh, Jack uh, is fixing his ribs as we speak, you know what I'm saying? You got some. My boy, my boy Elias uh, has another job as a ring, as a ring girl. <laughs> so, uh, as far as Paulo Costa, I mean, yeah, you know, if Elias isn't available, you could uh, – you know, I know my boy David Branch is looking for a fight. That might be a little bit too. Yeah, that might, that might be that might be the fight. Branch versus Costa. Yeah, you like that? Yeah, I mean because we know Branch is you know that vet that's gonna test you, and uh, you know we know that he just knocked my head of the fuck out. Who's a big Brazilian with muscles? Let's see if he can knock uh, two Brazilians out with muscles. I like that. You could also do a Paulo Costa or Cesar Mutanti. Let's see if uh, let's see. Oh, if, Cesar, uh, Cesar's been talking shit to Paulo too for a while. So let's see how that chin holds up. You know, my boy <laughs> Cesar hasn't been knocked out since 2015, but the way that Cesar Cesar's due for a canvas snap. The way that Costa <laughs> slings those bombs, I'm not sure if uh, Mutanti can work around that. So I'd love to see that fight. As far as your eye, Hall, look, just keep him in that gatekeeper status, man. You know, whoever needs a win. My, my boy Brad Tavares needs a win. Let's see Brad Tavares versus they're, your Hall. They're, they're, they're teammates, but... Um, well, do you want to be top 10 in your weight class or not, kids? I don't think Uriah does, bro. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think... They're, they're definitely not going to fight. But, you know, I think uh, Uriah should, you know... Uh, you know, how about how about Uriah Hall versus Gerald Mershart? Okay, yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. That's a, that's a good matchup there. So, Rafael Asuncao defeated Robbie Font, 30-27 on all, all judges' scorecards. And uh, once again, uh, Rafael put on another clinic. I mean, he hurt Robbie Font with the straights. He mixed in the takedowns. He used nice leg kicks. Uh, the one thing I will say, I was surprised uh, at Robbie Font's uh, bottom game because I thought for sure when Rafa got on top, I thought he was about to submit Robbie Font, and uh, Robbie survived. So, props to him. Yeah, you know my boy is that world-class fighter. And like we were saying, Asensio might be the best man weight on earth, man. I mean, he beat Marlon Marais. And if Marais is a champion in six months, you know, unfortunately, they never give my boy Asensio the enough, enough credit. They're probably going to skip him over for the title shot again. He's probably going to have to fight Lineker or <laughs> fucking, you know, one of these tough fights again because, you know, it's unfortunate. They don't, they don't, uh, they don't pay him enough respect. I mean, he just wiped out Robbie Font 30-27. He's beaten more than half of the top 15. Pedro, Caraway, Aljamain, Marlon, TJ, TJ uh, Lopez, Johnny Eduardo. Uh, everyone. I mean, everyone, man. <laughs> like, the guy's literally beating everyone. So, to be honest, if I was a Sunset, I'm putting my foot down, man. I'm telling him once and for all, I'm, I'm done with your shit. It's either title shot or Dominic Cruz. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Rafael since I should not take another fight except a title fight or Dominic Cruz. Nothing more, nothing less. As far as Rob Font, I mean, look, man, it's time to work your way back up the ladder. You tried your chances against the number three guy on planet Earth. Didn't quite work out. So we could see uh, Robbie Font, uh, you know, if Brett Johns happens to get a win over Pedro Munoz, we could see Robbie Font and... And uh, and Brett Johns, or if Brett Johns loses to Pedro Munoz, we could see Robbie Font versus Brett Johns. So I wouldn't mind seeing a matchup like that. I just noticed they took uh, my boy Brian Caraway out the top fifteen. I was thinking Robbie Font versus Caraway, but um, is uh, Caraway in the middle of contract negotiations or something? I I, I wouldn't think so because him not being in the top fifteen is kind of he might have just maybe he signed with somewhere else. Interesting. Well, if he's still in the UFC, that'd be a good fight. If not. After win or lose for Brett Johns and Munoz, I'd like to see Brett Johns and Robbie Font have a go at it. So, you know, another possibility, if you want to rush this guy up, what about uh, Sugar Sean O'Malley versus Robbie Font? <laughs> you know, if uh, Rob Font wants that smoke, he could uh, he could definitely uh, come get that O'Malley smoke. We know uh, when you fight O'Malley, it's more than just fighting O'Malley. You're fighting uh, the UFC hype machine. Yeah, that'd be very interesting. You know, both guys would stand and bang. I wonder how Rob would deal with that length. And uh, I think uh, there's a chance that Sean O'Malley might get disrespected at the betting window like he did against Sukumtut. So I'd like to see that as well. 
Now, obviously, we already talked about this, but let's just kind of briefly go over it again. Drakkar Close defeated Lando Venata 30-27. Uh, and uh, listen, man, I mean, he went out there. He had a very nice clinch-heavy approach. He basically didn't let Lando get off on any of his strikes, and uh, he went out there and did his thing. It was an MMA lab performance. Yeah, you know, that was uh, the typical MMA lab performance. And as far as where he goes from here, you know, Jakar, uh, he beat the Casey, he beat Lando. Um, man, and it was a clean win as well. So, uh, what about him and Bobby Green? Um, they're boys, actually. Like, they, I saw them taking pictures with each other. So, you don't think they'd uh, take multiple thousands to fight each other? Um, no, not with like as many guys there as there is at lightweight. Um, I could see, uh, damn, he already fought Tamar. Um, who you got between Drakkar Close and Kiesa? Yeah, you know, something like that. <laughs> you know, I got, I could probably got Drakkar now. I think Kiesa's on his way out. Or how about this? How about Drakkar Close versus Charles Oliveira? Okay. Yeah, that's a nice Or Drakkar Close versus Alan Patrick. Drakkar Close versus... The, win, uh, the winner of Demir and Nick Hahn. You know, something like that. Or how about Jakar Close versus uh, Davi Hamish? You know my boy Davi Hamish is on Instagram and he's walking <laughs> lions with leashes right now? Yeah, that's uh, he's, uh, he's a crazy Brazilian My, my boy Davi Hamish is feeding baby tigers out of, a, out of a milk bottle right now. Like, my boy Davi Hamish doesn't play games. Yeah, so, you know, him and uh, Jakar should definitely get it because we know, we know uh, Davi uh, is a third-degree black belt and you know the second Davi gets on top of you you're pretty much fucked um so I would love to see that fight as far as Lando he needs a big change because this wasn't the guy that we saw in his first uh four UFC appearances where he got a 50k bonus each time and he was known for that massive output those flashy moves he basically was completely gun shy he didn't pull the trigger at all it was very surprising to see but at the same time you know you and I were kind of talking about this in person it might have been a Jason Knight situation where he just took way too much damage so if we got if we're gonna have to change things up uh I suggest uh two ideas number one you cut him and you let him grind his teeth back on the local scene. We'd love to have Lando in the NFC. Or number two, you make him go down to featherweight and you put him in there with Jason Knight. Uh, you know, I think uh, the fact that, you know, he's in that Knight category. And like I said with Knight before the uh, – or after the Americani fight, you know, I don't think he's going to win another UFC fight. And you have to put him, you know, in a, uh, in a competitive match because of the name value. So, you know, unfortunately for Lando, I really don't know where he goes from here. You know, unless they find, you know, a cupcake like, you know, T about, unless they find a cupcake for him. But um, unfortunately, man, when you take that much damage, you never really, uh, you know, operate at that same frequency again. So most likely it's probably over, just like, you know, uh, Andres and I. Man, it's sad because he's only 26 years old. So, you know, <clears throat> I was thinking, oh, he was 24 years old, dropping Tony Ferguson three times. Wait till you see what happens when he gets older. <laughs> but as you know, age is nothing but a number. It's all about that damage meter. And similar to other guys we've talked about, my boy Lando, uh, his damage meter might be completely filled, Shaq. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Uh, it's unfortunate because, you know, Jakar, close coming into the fight, really wasn't known for his boxing. I mean, when have you ever really seen him let his hands go besides that debut fight against Powell? Um, so, you know, the fact that now, you know, the areas where you think these guys have the strength, you know, they're not, you know, winning at those areas anymore. So that pretty much lets you know that the end of the road is probably near. Yeah, that's very sad because the kid was super talented, had so much potential. I mean, D1 wrestling, you've seen what his striking is capable of. So it, it was just sad to see a guy like that not be able to pull the trigger for a three-round duration. And you know it's a direct result of the accumulation of all the wars he's been in. So, you know, I wish Lando the best. I hope he can turn things around. But uh, it's not looking good, Shaq. Now, welterweight division, Curtis Melender, he went out there. He beat Max Griffin 29-28 on all three cards. And, man, uh, this kid Curtis Melender, he's got some serious striking. He's a very educated striker out there. Uh, obviously, there was something very alarming off his back, but Max Griffin wasn't able to capitalize. But I mean, you put Curtis Melender in there with someone like Gunny, and Gunny gets on top, and uh, Gunny will choke Curtis Melender out if he gets on top. Yeah, but you know, I think he—I don't think he's going to get those type of fights now. I feel like you know, you keep him in these striker, you know, striker type of fights, and you know, uh, like I said, I want to see him fight Perry because you know Perry's short, but we know Perry isn't scared to come in, and Perry's got a little, you know, clinch tie-up game. So you know, let's see if. Uh, 
he can uh, take Melinda down because he's single leg that felt. I know Felder's a lightweight, but you know at least uh, it's in Perry's arsenal. Yeah, and as far as uh, Max Griffin's concerned, I want to see him and uh, Yancey Madero's run it, man, because, you know... Yeah, Max- you know, I think Griffin's going to be, you know, the, one of those 500 fighters, but, you know, he's going to be a memorable 500 fighter, you know, he's going to have uh, big upsets like, you know, Perry, and then, you know, he'll come back to reality and lose to the guy that, you know, he's supposed to lose to, like Melender. So, you know, I was thinking, you know, uh, um, you know, a Tim Means or, you know, a... Uh, a below Muhammad, or you know a uh, you know a Yancey, a Yancey, you know things like that. Fun fights. Yeah, I'm thinking Yancey versus Max Griffin. So man, Dan Hooker went out there and he knocked out Gilbert Burns. It was beautiful. Left hook to the body, left hook to the head. Great combination. And one thing we were talking about on the show, you know, with these guys like Gilbert Burns, these grapplers, they get a couple knockouts and they fall in love with their knockout power. They think they're strikers. And, uh, you know, we can sit here and talk about how he tried to bang with Hooker, but let's not forget about the fact that he shot in on Hooker. Hooker actually attacked the neck of Gilbert Burns, and he made Gilbert Burns know that, hey, man, if you want to shoot on me, I don't care what degree black belt you are. I'm going to choke you out, so you better uh, try and stand with me. Well, he, he got the memo. He tried to stand with him, and he got knocked out anyway, Shaq. Yeah, Burns resorted back to his old ways. You know, Hooker was that guy to finally, you know, put the pressure on his chin again. And Hooker, man, he's been looking real good. You know, not so many guys have done that uh, to Gilbert Burns. Shaq and Rashid didn't even do that to him. So Alex Cowboy Hooker, didn't do that. He said, well, no. Alex Cowboy didn't do that either. Exactly. So, you know, uh, Hooker's on a four or five win streak. I think this one sets up a big showdown. I think uh, him... Um, I feel like it's time now. I feel like if y'all want to, you know, test Gregor Gillespie, I feel like, you know, him and Hooker should do it, you know, either co-main events uh, style on an FS1 card or, you know, uh, or like on a fight pass card in Australia or something, man. It's time to test Gillespie. It's time to see if Hooker uh, will uh, wilt back to the wrestling. So I'm, I'm thinking Gregor Gillespie versus Dan Hooker. Dude, I fucking love that matchup, actually, because, you know, on the broadcast they were saying, Hooker should get a top 10 guy. I was like, whoa, whoa, slow down. He beat Ross Pearson, Jim Miller, DeCasey, and Gil Burns. Let's chill out with this top 10 talk because none of those guys are top 15. But I love Hooker versus uh, Gregor Gillespie for a co-main event, so I'm with you on that. Now, I personally didn't watch the Emily Whitmire versus Jamie Moyle fight. Did you? Yeah, I watched it. So uh, any any take, any take parting thoughts? Any, any opinion? I mean, I guess that value was on Whitmire, man. She looked a uh, she looked a lot better, man. She definitely, uh, you know, Moyle should never be at those type of lines, and you know, it was kind of frustrating to watch, you know, not have an action on Whitmire, honestly. But you know, I feel like uh, whoever played Whitmire, props to them because you know that's uh, taking the value there. But you know, uh, she uh, won two rounds, pretty much. Yeah. So now let's recap this tough finale. Israel Adesanya went out there, defeated Brad Tavares, 50-45 on two cards, 49-46 on the other, and dude, holy shit. I've been trying to tell you, I've been trying to tell you about my boy Israel, man. Man, he is for real, and not only that, did you notice uh, his physique difference between this fight and the uh, the Marvin uh, Vittori fight? It looked like he uh, got two weight classes bigger in between, because before, you remember he was weighing in at like 182, 183 for one of those fights. A lot of people were saying he might be a small middleweight. Uh, I don't think anyone's saying he's a small middleweight anymore, Shaq. Yeah, you know, that's just a uh, progressive work in the gym. And that whole gym, man, they, uh, they're on point. Him, Hooker, Shane Young, they've been uh, on a roll, man. So, you know, I definitely thought he uh, had more size. But I think he's just getting more comfortable in that octagon, man. And he likes those big moments. And, you know, I put him in that category with those guys that, you know, know how to play that, that slip and rip game. Like Connor, like, uh, like uh, O'Malley, you know. Um, I can't solid. think of you know, you know that game where they just know how to, you know, pull your counter out and make you look real silly, <laughs> and uh, that's exactly what he did, man. And you know, I felt like it was a fight where Brad. I don't know why Brad was taking that fight, man. Uh, Israel is a guy that you know, you let him, you know, train for another three, four months, and he's gonna come back with the type of physical tools that he has. He's so long, and we saw that jab just eat Brad Tavares up, you know, in the line. He was low-kicking the low-kicker, you know what I'm saying? He even pretty kind of won the grappling exchanges, too. So, you know, I think Israel uh, is serious at 185. I think, uh, to be honest, ultimately, I think we're going to see a, a scenario where, you know, if, if Rob Whitaker can, you know, hold on to that belt, 
for, uh, you know, if he can get past Kelvin. I think Israel can honestly work his way up into that fight with Rob, have a, you know, a little Australian uh, Kiwi showdown yeah, down there yeah. in a, down there in Australia because I honestly think Israel's that skilled and I think uh, within a few months he's even going to be better sooner or later guys aren't even going to be able to get on his legs and on the feet I mean standing in front of him I think everyone's fucked to be honest do we have a dark horse in the middleweight division because I remember before Rob Whitaker was champ I called him the dark horse well now Israel's the dark horse man the improvements that he's been making in such short amount of time I can't wait to see what he looks. I can't wait to see what the next version of Israel Adesanya looks like. Because uh, if Friday night was any indication, holy shit, middleweight division because is on you know, notice. I, I agree with you know some people saying if Weidman gets on top of him, it's completely different. And you know, of course it is. Weidman's a, a serious black belt. But the thing is, if uh, Israel finds a way to get back up to his feet, uh, I, I don't think Weidman's getting a, another takedown. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's for sure. And, you know, look, Israel's only three fights into his UFC career. So I kind of want to see him, you know, get those highlight reel knockouts going, get a couple more wins, get that name out there before they rush him to that title shot. Plus, Kelvin and uh, and Rob have to film the ultimate fighter in the meantime anyway. So what I was thinking was, uh, you know, there's a guy that's in the top 15 that a lot of people know about. Uh, his name's Elias Theodoro. I want to see Israel Adesanya versus Elias <laughs> Theodoro, Shaq. <laughs> Oh boy, Elias! Uh, no, I don't want that smoke. You know, if uh, if Elias uh, thinks he can be a top fifteen guy, barely getting past Trevor Smith, uh, let's see him keep his ranking against Israel Adesanya. <laughs> you got a better idea? <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely not going to happen. Elias is a bum, bro. <laughs> and as far as Brad Tavares, you know, take some time off and you know come back and got you know. Start, start, think, start, start all over again. Uh, you know, I think he's going to be fine to be honest. Because I actually thought he looked really good. I just think he was fighting the best uh, prospect in the middleweight division in a fight where I feel like he really shouldn't have taken. I feel like he got set up taking this fight. I don't know why he took this fight in the first place. And you know, I think he goes back to you know being old Brad Tavares. I think you know the fact that he stayed in there five rounds. Because I guarantee you. Half of that middleweight division would have been uh, taking canvas snaps. Uh, Mahetta, uh, Branch, uh, Costa probably. Uh, I mean, I think everyone in the middleweight division would have probably been taking canvas snaps. So props to Brad Tavares for surviving those five rounds. You know, you should fight... Um, Mahetta, I like that. Yeah, Brad Tavares versus Mahetta. Boom, there you go. Yeah, I think it's a good matchup. And w one thing I want to say about Israel's is grappling, obviously the defensive grappling was on point the first couple rounds, but how about towards the championship rounds when he started attacking Brad Tavares and he almost got that Kimura? I'll tell you what, don't be surprised when Israel Adesanya submits a couple people uh, in his next couple fights, Shaq. Yeah, I think he's the dark horse in the middleweight division. And like I said, uh, be ready for that him and uh, Whitaker showdown. Hopefully Whitaker can, can uh, get through Kevin and hopefully he doesn't have to fight Yoel in the meantime again. So we'll keep it short and sweet on these. Uh, Mike Trezano defeated Joe Gennetti to win the lightweight ultimate fighter. Uh, you know, Joe Gennetti kind of threw it away in that third and final round. I think he might have thought he had it in the bag, so he kind of ran away. It bit him in the ass. But as far as Mike Trezano, you know what I want to see? I want to see him in there with Luis Pena. Let's see who, who really is uh, the tough 27 uh, ultimate fighter. Yeah, you know, I think everyone wants that fight. That's definitely the route they should go. Let's see uh, who the real winner of Tough is. Gisano, you know, I thought he fought well. But, yeah, like you said, Gennetti just pretty much stopped fighting in the third round. <laughs> it was one-to-one, -one and he just quit fighting. So, you know, it's going to be tough. We know Luis Pena doesn't stop. He's one of those nonstop guys. So let's see uh, who the real winner of Tough is. And uh, Brad Katona beat Jay Kunichella for the Ultimate Fighter Featherweight. And, uh, yeah, nice little performance by Brad. I want to see Brad versus Makwan Amir Khani next. Um, you know, I, I think it was a good perform, uh, performance, but, you know, that guy he fought was, you know, I, I just don't think that guy's going to keep a spot on the UFC roster. Um, you know, I want to, what, what weight class is he, 45? Um, you know, I think, uh, he's a, he's a good fighter, but I think, uh, I don't think he's ready for a mock one. I think, uh, he should fight, like... That kid was really small. I actually think he's a bantamweight. Yeah, I think he is a bantamweight, bro. I think you said he's dropping back to 35. Um, so he's actually a bantamweight. Um, how about Guido Canetti versus Brad Katana? All right, oh. let's let's see it. Done. Alex Caceres and Martin Bravo had a war. Great fight. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I scored it for Alex Caceres. You know, I don't want to sit here and be like a 
they shouldn't have gotten the 50k bonus because I would never want to take that away from those guys because they went out there and fought like warriors. I personally thought Alessio Di Chirico and Julian Marquez should have got the fight of the night, but Alex and uh, Martin put on a show. Alex is the rightful winner, and uh, you know I think Alex uh, will keep his spot as you know the gatekeeper, you know journeyman type guy. You feed to your up and coming prospects, see if they're at that level. If they beat him, they move on. If they don't, they go to the back of the line. Yeah, you know, I thought he won the first two rounds. Bravo won the third round. Um, you know, um, Alex definitely is getting up there in age. He's definitely slowing down, like we predicted. But he pretty much hit it, you know, on the on point. He's uh, he's going to fight down to the level as a, of his opponents, and uh, definitely wasn't a robbery. I, I, I agreed with it being fighting tonight just because that third round was uh, pretty much insane. And Marcus uh, fucked Alessio up on the bonus anyway. So, you know, um, they uh, those two men definitely deserve their extra bonus. Definitely. Roxanne Modafari, didn't, she didn't just beat the soccer mom, bro. She finished Bar Ponchak via TKO elbows. Yeah, and, uh, she, she, uh, she took care of business like she uh, like she was serious. I mean, she beat her ass from, op- from the opening bell. So props to Roxanne. I think it's time, uh, you know, every, us along with everyone else, you know. Uh, I th- I'm going to actually take her out of that soccer mom category because I actually think she's Probably a top, you know, five, six chicken that weight class. I mean, I think she could fight Jessica Imex. Uh, Max best season not a fair. As far as Barb, uh, she can she can go rematch uh, Angela Magana on the regional scene. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, who really cares, you know? <laughs> so, uh, Alessio Di Chirico and Julian Marquez had a war. In my opinion, that was the fight of the night. Unbelievable fight. And, man, that weight advantage for Julian Marquez definitely came into play. I mean, those four extra pounds, he weighed in 190 pounds and – Dude, anytime he would land a shot, I would feel it, let alone Alessio would feel it, man. Julian Marquez packed some serious power. I think Alessio slightly edged him in terms of volume. But in terms of the power shots, uh, you got to give it to Marquez. But the volume and the takedowns went to Alessio, and uh, he went out there and he edged the decision. Yeah, the top position was the deciding factor. I thought the weight advantage played a huge factor. Marquez... Like we, like you were saying, you know, every shot you could feel Alessio just being like, damn, this motherfucker hits hard. But I thought Alessio looked the best he ever bit. I thought he came out in the first round with that southpaw stance looking out, looking like uh, Carlo Petersali out there Some with that body left kick, kick to bro. the body. I was like, oh. And then, and then I thought, you know, he got that takedown in the first. So I thought that first round was his. You know, he was starting to tire out a little bit in the uh, second uh, Marquez definitely won that round, and he got more top position, and he landed more body kicks in the third. I thought Marquez, if it would have got scored for Marquez, I would have totally understood. But I definitely thought Alessio did enough to win that fight. I thought he deserved the win. And I thought Marquez is actually a lot better than I thought because he was fighting a lot of those takedowns. But his, like we said on the show, his takedown defense is super suspect. So that's what he's got to work on. But props to Alessio. And, uh, you know, those Italians are uh, doing work down there. Yeah, I will say this. Julian Marquez's cardio definitely got a lot better. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's something yeah, yeah. he, he, he got a lot better. Now, as far as uh, what's next for Alessio Di Chirico, you know, let's not rush it. I, I think he should go in there and uh, and fight Darren Stewart next. <laughs> you know, I, I think uh, we want to we want to we want to get him at a good line. So, you, oh, you don't think that'll be line close? Because I mean, everyone thinks Alessio lost this fight, and Darren Stewart. Just finished Eric Spicely, who finished Alessio. You don't think it'll be a pick em? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that fucking Stewart sucks. Um, fucking, I think, uh, how about Alessio versus uh, Talis? Okay, are we ready to stop, the, uh, to stop those tie-ups? I mean, bro, we just grew, we just grinded out hard with the guy that fucking is a gorilla, you know what I'm saying, for three rounds. Because my, my motherfucker Marquez is like a light heavyweight, bro. All right. So I'm thinking Talos versus Alessio. We can do it in Sao Paulo if he wants, you know. Um, or you can come to your European turf. Uh, yeah, I like it. As far as Julian's concerned, I don't know if he stays at 85 or if he goes up to 205, but regardless, I'll be watching because he's, oh, yeah. he's a super exciting guy. How about uh, Marquez versus Pijota? There you go. That's a that's a fun matchup. I'd, it'd be interesting to see if a Pijota, if he gets on top, if he can seal the deal, or if Marquez or, is able to get back up to his feet and gas him out. Or I could see a stand. We could do a stand up fight like uh, Roberson versus Marquez. Yeah, there's lots of options. Lots of options for sure. So uh, this one, uh, we'll keep it short and sweet. Montana De La Rosa beat my girlfriend Rachel Ostovich via submission rear naked choke and. 
It, it was a very sad night Friday, Shaq. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, my, shout out to Montana. She got a lot. Her boxing got uh, definitely got way better. You know, these young fighters are making those improvements. And, you know, Asovic, uh, she just wasn't tough enough. And, you know, but I, I don't think her uh, her stock goes down at, by any means. In what weight class is my girl, uh, Gian Kim in? Uh, 125. All right, cool. So let's see Montana De La Rosa versus Gian Kim, and let's see Rachel Ostovich versus... Uh, oh, damn, they fought on tough already. Fuck, her and Fabian already fought on tough. But Montana De La Rosa versus Gian Kim, let's see that. I mean, yeah, I, I agree with that. So Luis Pena went out there, cashed that max bet in under four minutes against Richie Smolin. Now, the one thing we had to look out for was the leg locks of Richie Smolin. You know how those leg lock guys are. But uh, it was Luis Pena who submitted Richie Smolin in the first round. And, man, right away when Richie Smolin took him down that easily, I was like, Luis, seriously? But, you know, those long bodies are hard to hold down. He found his way back up, started piecing him up on the feet, dropped him, and uh, locked in that choke and uh, cashed the max bet. Yeah, you know, we you know predicted that first, second round finish. You know, these leg lock guys really don't last. I think uh, Richie is super inexperienced anyways. And, you know, I'm not going to bash on that guy too much or – on his team, but, you know, it, it is what it is. But uh, Luis handled business. Now it's on to Trezano next. Absolutely. Uh, John Gunther versus Alan Zuniga. Worst fight <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. Both guys should be cut from uh, the UFC. Both guys need to come down to the NFC. I want to see John Gunther versus uh, Robert King Hale in the NFC. And I want to see Alan Zuniga versus John Cobb in the NFC. Get both of our guys wins over UFC vets. And then get both of our guys signed in the UFC. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, that's not going to happen. But, you know, I think uh, Zuniga is out the UFC for sure. And, you know, he's going to go back to the Costa Rican scene. And, you know, uh, Gunther will stay in just because he's Stipe's boy. And, you know, he's uh, he was on a TV show. So, you know, uh, I'm thinking Gunther versus, you know, Claudio Puelas next or something like that. You know what's – you, know, you want to know something, Shaq? You want to do a little MMA trivia? Who Who's currently in the UFC, John Gunther or Damian Brown? <laughs> You know, uh, John Gunther, but, you know, uh, you John Gunther's under, he's undefeated in the UFC, unfortunately. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, let Damian Brown get that roster spot back. You know, this is that's just a – with John Gunther, it's just a, a ratings thing. You know, he's an alpaca shearer, so, you know, people are going to watch him whether he's shitty or not. So, unfortunately, uh, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, John Gunther's going to be making about 50 and 50 in a few in a few months. And, uh, you know, he's going to be have a UFC career. Yeah, just get that punch drunk alpaca guy off my TV, please. <laughs> so uh, Bryce Mitchell defeated Tyler Diamond. A lot of people thought it was a robbery. I disagree. I thought that Bryce Mitchell won the first half of the fight. I thought Diamond won the second half of the fight. It comes down to which you favor more. I thought uh, Bryce edged it. All came out of that second round. I thought he won, you know, about three and a half minutes of the second round. Tyler Diamond won about one and a half minutes of the second round. Therefore, I give it to Bryce. How'd you score it? Yeah, I thought, to be honest, I kind of thought Diamond won every round. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it is what it is. Uh, he, I mean, it was definitely questionable. I thought Diamond, because uh, I thought, you know, at the end of the second round, Mitchell had his face uh, in the mat getting his head smashed in. So, But, you know, I thought Diamond won every round. Mitchell, uh, he's a tough guy because he definitely hung in there. But, you know, I definitely thought uh, Diamond won that fight. Yeah, and, uh, you know, for a D1 wrestler, I was very surprised he wasn't able to stop those takedowns. But he had amazing get-ups. His get-up game is very on point. Now, Steven Peterson defeated Matt Bissett. Hey, Steven Peterson won a UFC fight, check. And, uh, you know, it's funny. Matt Bissett came out, and he, he did the whole, uh, one Somo going to stand and bang with me? You know, he did that whole thing. So I guess that means that if they don't cut Matt Bissett, they can put him in there with Jason Knight next. And as far as Steven Peterson, shit, uh, what about Steven versus Makwan Amir Khani? Um... Is he going to stuff? <laughs> I don't know. Let's find uh, out. No, 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 don't put him in those fights. Put him in fun fights because Michael is just going to let it come to him. But, um, you know, Peterson's a, yeah, he's a junkyard dog. You know, eventually, you know, with these junkyard dogs, you know, Steven's damage meter is going to get up there really quick. You know, I see a lot of people um, uh, comparing him to Jason Knight. So, you know, if him and Jason Knight want to get down, that'll be like uh, – you know, a Mississippi guy versus a Texas guy, two uh, 
two workmen junkyard dogs going at it. So, but yeah, Peterson is just a junkyard dog. He never stops coming. He just has a volume punching style. So, uh, Bissett wilted, and, and that's just the facts. Bissett didn't want it hard enough. He gave that second round away, and then he uh, gave the third round away. So, you know, I want to see uh, Steven Peterson in fun fights. I don't want to see, you know, I feel like he's like in that Brandon Davis category. If you give him guys that are going to wrestle, he's just going to, you know, get stalled out. So, how about uh, would Chaz fight him? Yeah, Chaz would absolutely fight him. Yeah, there we go. Boom. All right, Chaz Kelly versus Steven Peterson. Good return for the scrapper. Now, uh, Gerald Mershart defeated Oscar Pijota via second round rear naked choke. And this was a beautiful performance because Oscar Pijota, he came out there and he was so smooth the way he took down Gerald Mershart. It was so smooth the way he passed his guard. I was like, man. I actually, I actually got a better fight. How about Shane Young versus uh, Steven Peterson? That would be a really good fight. <laughs> Shane Young versus Steven? That was good. But as far as Oscar Pijota, look, the way he was passing that guard was beautiful. I mean, he was looking so technical, so crisp. But... As you know, everyone's got to take that first L. It was simply time for you know for him to take his. And people are saying it's a cardio issue. It was not a cardio issue at all because I saw him go three rounds in his UFC debut. It was simply a point where you try to finish Mershart super hard. When Mershart reversed that position at the end of the first round, Mershart started landing some big knees to the body of Oscar Pijota. That took all the wind out of his sails. And then uh, Gerald took over in that second round, started giving him that vet lesson, and he uh, choked him unconscious. Uh, man, Gerald Mershart is an absolute dog. Yeah, it was a typical undefeated fighter mistake that a lot of undefeated fighters have to learn from in that first though. He tried to finish him in the first round and gassed himself out. And when he came back out for the second, he had nothing left. And he got finished by a guy with 40, over 40, 50 fights, you know. So Mershart's 4-1 and one in the UFC now. He's an absolute dog. He weathered that storm. He knew exactly how to play it. You know, let the uh, young guy come out thinking he's got a quick, easy finish. I think Oscar's going to come back fine after this. I just think he had to take that first L and, you know, learn how to manage that gas tank. A lot of guys make that mistake in the early in their careers, and he'll be back. And I think my boy Mershart uh, deserves a big fight. Like I said, you're right, Hall. Yeah, you're right, Hall versus Mershart. And I love some of those escapes that Mershart was doing. You know, when Oscar had his back and Oscar tried to sink in that choke, I love how Mershard escaped using his hips and then uh, got on top. And with Oscar, I want to see him and uh, Julian Marquez run it. So some great matchups to be made. Well, Shaq, we recap both cards, man. They were both epic. And uh, next event is uh, UFC Boise, and uh, it's time to get this money, my man. Yeah, you know, uh, USC Boys is going to be one of the biggest nights of the year. It's time to sign up at bestfightpicks at gmail.com and uh, let us get you squared away. Absolutely. We're long-term winners. We're here to get the job done. UFC Boise is going to be great. So let's get it. Make sure you follow me on Twitter at Best Fight Picks. Follow Shaq at MMA Genius 05. Follow our Instagram at Best Fight Picks Official. Sign up to Best Fight Picks at bestfightpicks.com at maxbetseason.com. Hook up those five-star reviews on iTunes. Shaq and I will be back later this week to break down UFC Boise. So until the next time, let's cash these bets.